Hey, how's it going? Uh, we are going to get started. Hopefully we've got people coming in. Um, apparently, I have been accused of starting lectures with dad jokes. Bad jokes? What in the world is going on? Don't make me pitch my new makeup palette collection where we have fantastic colors such as state capacity and exclusive institutions. It'll give you that nice foundation and blush you're looking for. Um, man, I cannot believe I'm being accused of bad jokes or dad jokes or whatever that is. I work hard to make sure my jokes are terrible. Thank you very much. Yes, we are talking about the Great Depression today. Let me bring up some pictures from the Great Depression to show you just to give you, again, that sense of scale of w what was happening. Um, this is not a line for Costco toilet paper. This is actually a bread line, um, but, I mean, kind of similar. So this is a line of people who are waiting for aid. You know, they, they're looking for food. They, it, you can see close... If you squint, you can see I will feed 20 or something. It's a line for a restaurant... There are people going without food at this time. They need help from the government. Um, over here on the other side, we have, I guess it's over here, we have the, um, the what is this, the unemployment line. These are people searching for jobs. These are postings for jobs that are available. They, they're standing out there. They look quite dapper. Um, I mean, it, they're probably trying to look their best as they're trying to get these jobs, but it's just a sense of style they have to appreciate. But again, remember, this is a huge drop in domestic output. This is a huge drop in income, huge drop in uh, employment. We have estimates that say unemployment went as high as 25%. That's huge, right? Like even right now, when we're talking about what's going on in the world, I mean, some people are estimating 30% unemployment. That seems a little high. Like, I don't want to say that and then have <laughs> have those words come back and bite me. It seems a little high to have unemployment. Or it seems a little absurd to have unemployment go that high. We're, but we're looking at just a time when it's really hard to imagine living through this. Um and then, just now, this is the headline that was on the Wall Street Journal just 20 minutes ago. I'm sure it's there right now. Dow climbs in best day since 1933 on stimulus hopes. What are we talking about today? We are going to be talking about what happens in 1933 and getting out of the Great Depression. I, I hope that you're excited that you're taking this class right now. I hope that as things are going around the world that you're saying, you know what? Things might be crazy, but I at least feel like I understand some of what's going on. Um, I'm trying to put up as much content as I can to help you understand what's going on. Um, I've put up a few videos on the Federal Reserve. Um, I did that video a few weeks ago on comparing this to 2008. As things unfold, I'm sure I'll do more videos, so keep your eyes open for what's going on there. But I, mean, I just... This is, seems like such a great time to be taking this class. So I hope, I hope that you're getting out of it what you need, and I hope that you're taking the time to look into these resources. Um, I will put, I don't have them in there right now. Uh, I'm, I think on the last lecture I put this in, but I'll put a link to some really good resources on learning about the Great Depression. Um, the, there's a website called federalreservehistory.org fantastic resources. This is this is amazing that we have that available to us. And I think really what's helping us through this time right now is having all of this history of knowing what's happened before. And I think that's just really one of the struggles that some of the people are having today as they look at economic policy, as they look at what is going on in the world. They don't understand that we've faced similar things in the past. They don't understand how we got out of them. They don't understand, you know, they haven't learned from history. 
And that's why this is so exciting to be having this class right ahead of this. Like I, I'm as bad as things are right now, I feel like it's a great time to be taking this class and to be teaching this class. So I hope you're getting what you need to out of this class. Just a quick review. Um, and by quick, I mean we might go into it just a minute or two because you need to remember what we talked about last time to understand how we're going to get out of this or how we're going to get out of the Great Depression, not today. But remember, we had three main causes of the Great Depression. And like, not one of these is the cause of the Great Depression. It's a combination of these things. First, we have the stock market crash of 1929. Now, a lot of people will say this was the cause of the Great Depression, but it wasn't the cause, okay? Remember, we showed how we were starting to recover. We were starting to get out of that Great Depression, not that Great Depression, out of that stock market crash, and then more stuff happened. We kept going, right? So we have the stock market crash, and that crash is driven largely by people who are buying stocks with debt, Remember, there. Uh, this, this was called margin purchases. You buy a whole bunch of stock uh, with a loan. You put the stock that you buy with your own cash as collateral on that. And then as the market goes down, so if the market's going up, you're going to make a ton of money. But if the market starts to go down, then you could lose a ton of money. And since the market started to go down, people sell off. That makes the market go down even further. And it's just this cascading effect, this death spiral. And that led to the stock market crash. We're going to see a similar thing when we get to 2008. Uh, it's really going to happen in 2007 with the housing market. We also have bank runs. We have people withdrawing cash from banks. The banks go out of business. We lose the currency. We're losing information. We're having this big financial panic that's rippling through and affecting the entire economy. And finally, we have the drain on gold, which again is related to finances. All of these things are related to finances. Of course, stock market bank runs, and the drain on gold. The foreigners, foreigners just generally are afraid that the U.S. is going to leave the gold standard, uh, which means that the dollars they were holding were going to be worth less. So they start exchanging their dollars for gold. They start taking gold out of the economy. And as a result, we start getting deflation. All these things are contributing to deflation, but the gold standard especially is contributing to deflation. So all of this is leading to aggregate demand, a decrease in aggregate demand or expenditures. And they're decreasing because the money supply is decreased and people are worried about the future. They don't know how long is this going to last. They don't know what's going to happen if I hold on to all this. You know, if I spend all my money today and I don't have any money coming in tomorrow, am I going to be out of luck? It's just this, this, remember we compared it to a psychological depression. You don't just tell people to get out of it. It takes time. It's, it's something that uh, you might need some assistance. All while this is happening, the Federal Reserve is basically doing nothing. Or they're acting the opposite way as they should. You know, they remember we talked about how they had certain models in their mind about how the economy worked. We talked about liquidationists, which meant that they thought that uh, recessions are good for the economy because it has this kind of purging effect. It helps us get rid of the dead weight in the economy. And then we also had the um, real bills theory, which has the opposite monetary th theory that we believe that uh, they thought in times – when times are good, you should put more currency into the economy. When times are bad, you should withdraw. But that ends up having the opposite effect. So they have these models in their mind about how the economy works. And then they make act, they act in a way that actually hurts the economy. Because it turns out the economy does not work like that. So we kind of put a lot of blame on the Federal Reserve for the Great Depression. Because even though we have these three things that happened, the Federal Reserve could have stepped in and helped or alleviated from these concerns. And instead, they just sat around. Um, a slide that I skipped in the last one, I said we would cover it today, that's right here. The question is, could the Fed have done more? Could the Federal Reserve acted to mitigate these panics? Um, you know, How do we know? We need... To, in order to understand whether the Fed could have acted more, 
we need a counterfactual, right? We need something where we can compare this is a world where the Fed did something. This is a world where the Fed didn't, right? This is back to the future where we want to go to the uh, enchantment under the sea dance. And we want to change a few things and see how that changes the future. Can we go back in time and see with the Fed acting and with the Fed not acting, get a comparable situation and see whether the Fed could have done more to stop bank failures? Well, it turns out we have a really nice way to look at this. It's these kind of things are what economists just love. So we ha- I mentioned that the Federal Reserve has a whole bunch of different branches. There's, um, you know, you have Atlanta, St. Louis, we have San Francisco, we have uh, Kansas City, we have Boston, New York. We've got all these branches across the United States. And back at this time, each of those uh, branches had the authority to act in their best interest. So today, the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C. acts basically on its own. Not on its own, sorry. They act in conjunction. And then when they make that decision, then all the branches kind of step in line with the Federal Reserve Board. Back during this time, that's not what happened. The branches had authority to act according to what they thought would best help. Well, it turns out that two branches had differing opinions on what should happen. Atlanta and St. Louis. Atlanta believed in what we what our monetary policy is today. They believed that the Fed should counteract recessions and it should have expansionary policy. What's expansionary policy? Remember we talked about in the last uh, lecture, expansionary policy is when the Federal Reserve puts currency into the system so that way there's more currency circulating provides liquidity to banks, and that way interest rates go down, credit goes up, and we have more – we counteract the the bad stuff with more economic activity. St. Louis does not believe that that's what they should do. They believe what the other Federal Reserve branches did, that – you know, the Fed shouldn't do anything. This is good for the recession to come through and wipe everything out. Well, turns out Mississippi is divided between these two branches, between St. Louis and Atlanta. And so we're going to use this line as a division and we're going to create a counterfactual. We're going to say, here's a world north of this line where the Fed didn't act. And here's a world south of the line where the Fed did act. And guess what? They're in the same state. They're pretty close to each other geographically. We believe that economic conditions are pretty similar within the state of Mississippi. And so the differences between these two areas, if we see differences in outcomes, we're going contr- to we're going to attribute that to differences in Federal Reserve policy. And so here you have a dot. This is a map of Mississippi, and every dot. Let's uh, let me expand this out so you can see this a little better. Every dot is a suspended bank, um, and so there's slightly different sizes. Doesn't matter. Let's let's just focus on the dot. North of this line that goes down the middle is the St. Louis Fed, the one that says we should not act. South of this line is the Atlanta Fed, the one that believes we should act. Now, it's pretty clear to see that there are a lot more dots above the line than there are below the line. And this is telling us that the Federal Reserve acting had a big effect on whether banks were failing. So this is these are bank failures north of the line, Fed doesn't act, more banks fail. South of the line, Fed acts, not as many banks fail, right? The Federal Reserve had the power to mitigate what was going on during the Great Depression, and by not acting, the Depression was actually worse than it should have been. So with that summary of what caused the Great Depression and the Fed's role, the value proposition today is for you to understand how the U.S. started on the road to recovery after the Great Depression. What was it that helped things out of the Great Depression, what you know? Remember, we had that spiral. We're going to show you that that graph again, where things just kept going down, down, down. How do we pull out of that, and how do we get onto the road uh, for recovery? Before we get there, 
let's talk about why the government would intervene in the economy, which is like the question of the day is, you know, is the government going to intervene? Should the government intervene? What should the government do? What is the economic theory? What's the economic model behind what's going on with these questions? This is John Maynard Keynes. Um, he was a British economist, lived from 1883 to 1946. I, I know that this lecture is filled with economics majors. So let me just say, like, you'll hear a few times throughout your life, if you know so much about economics, why aren't you rich? Well, here's the thing. Keynes was. Keynes was this economist who actually got rich through his understanding of economics. He was a pioneer in using statistics and economics to invest in the stock market. He had, um, I mean, today, that's what, you, you can't survive in the stock market if you don't understand statistics and economics. He basically was the pioneer. He was the first one going out there, really putting this to work, and he died rich. That's not what his contribution to society is. That's not what his legacy is today. His legacy is that he helped us, well, I mean, he really formulated a lot of theory about how the government and macroeconomics interact. So this is called Keynesian theory. It's called Keynesian. Keynesian. If... <laughs> You know, with this move to online, maybe I can do this. I'll have, I could have a question that gives you this word and just tells you to pronounce it. And if you say Keynesian, then you automatically fail this class. It is not Keynesian, it's Keynesian. Keynesian. Um, so we talked about aggregate demand uh, a little bit last lecture. I mentioned it at the beginning of this lecture, but it is the sum of all expenditures in the economy. And this is a Keynesian concept. So this formula right here, y equals nx plus c plus i plus g. And again, let me expand this. A oh, I'm moving myself instead of the slides. Great. Let me move myself back there and the slides out here. Okay, so we have this formula that says y equals nx plus c plus i plus g. Y in this equation is aggregate demand. Okay, this is all ex expenditures. This is all output, all production. NX is net exports. That's exports minus imports. If our imports are greater than our exports, then it's positive. Or sorry, if imports are greater than exports, uh, it's negative because we're not. Anyway, the net exports part is not the important part of what we're talking about. We're going to talk about consumption, investment and government spending, C, I, and G. So we're going to assume that aggregate demand is defined as in that previous slide, that it's the aggregate demand is the, the, the sum of net exports, consumption, investment, and government spending. The economic fluctuations are caused by changes in aggregate demand. Okay, when we're having recessions, when we're having depressions, whatever is going on in the economy, that is caused by changes in either C, I, G, or NX. Um, so that means, let's think about what's going on today. People are staying in their homes. They're not going out and buying things. Well, buying things is consumption. Right, that's C. If consumption falls, then that's going to be a recession, or at least that's a drop in Y. Um, or we could think about investment. I'm not going out in a investment's going to be things like building houses or other types of buildings, or just things that are going to be around for a while. I don't go out and build these things. Uh, I stop investing in future opportunities, right? That's where economic fluctuations are going to come from. Changes in either C or I. The gover and then the next assumption is that the government has enough standing to borrow in troubled times and repay when times are good. Okay, so, you know, in, in a troubled time, it might be hard for me or for you to borrow money. Because the bank might not be sure about how long that you'll have money. They might be worried about whether you'll be able to pay them back. 
we're going to assume that the government actually has the power to borrow basically at any time and because people are certain or feel secure that the government's going to pay back. So the government's a safe borrower. So with these three things, what aggregate demand is, what causes economic fluctuations, and the government's ability to borrow, the conclusion is that we can counteract economic fluctuations with changes in government spending. Gee, and this just falls naturally from this equation. Okay, so we have this question, is this equation something we should note to remember? This is an important equation to understand about what's going on in the world today. Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX. The idea is, if cons so if Y equals C plus I plus G, let's ignore NX right now. If C falls, that's going to cause Y to fall. But if we can counteract that fall in C with an increase in G, then we can keep it level. So the idea is the government has the ability to come in and counteract economic fluctuations. And then Keynes would say that when the economy recovers, the government can pay off the debts by reducing expenditures and increasing taxes, right? So as C and I come back up, you reduce G and you pay off the debt from, pay, from G earlier by taxing people in the future. Okay, so you want to spend when times are bad. You want to tax when times are good. That's how you're going to pay it off. That's the basic Keynesian model, at least in the simplest of terms. Oh, which now brings us to one of my favorite videos to show. I hope this works out because it, it might not, but let me do this crazy vortex tunnel thing and then bring it to this video. You know, there's the link if you can't watch it. Why do you have this sign? Uh, do you disagree with it? That he's Keynesian? That he's like he's not American? Is that what you're saying? Well, we're saying, oh, I mean, we're asking the question. He was born in Hawaii. That is a state of the United States. He is born here legally, and he is an awesome president. Is he a Keynesian? No, absolutely not. It's possible. I mean, I'm not going to go and judge people. It doesn't matter. All right, maybe it would matter on his views on things, but like most of us come from, you know, Ireland, Germany, Italy, you know, most of us come from different countries. Until there's proof to the contrary, could what it be a proof? Do you want? He gave you proof. He gave you proof. He was born in Hawaii. What proof do you want? And, and you think that establishes that he's definitely not Keynesian? She's laughing. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I mean, you people are trying to make something out of nothing. I don't really see how it's relevant to his presidency. It is important, but it shouldn't be the only thing looked at. That's stupid. And that's what that sign is, stupid. And Americans, I'll tell you what, hopefully on, the, on November, the people are going to know that most Americans are not stupid and don't buy this. I don't, I don't know what his economic policies really are, personally, so I can't really answer that question. It's hard to know until we have proof one way or the other, right? Right, right. Yeah. I thought you said Kenyan. Oh, man, I love that clip. Let me get rid of this. Um, I hope that came through. I have no idea if it came through. Maybe the chat now says we can't hear anything. Um, man. Okay, here, let's get these questions. Um, how did we learn that increasing G increases Y? That just comes from the... I, oh, look at this. Hey, I have my whiteboard. Let me w walk through this. So you have Y equals C plus I plus G. Okay. That's how we're defined. Oh, it's so hard to do this. C plus I plus G, right? By the way, if you want a nice simple way to remember this, the way that I literally remember it is C R A I G. That is how I've remembered it since I was in high school. Okay. It, it works out really well. Just always remember me. Keep me in your heart, always. Um, okay, so C plus I plus G. The idea is C goes down. If you want to keep this the same, you could increase G. Okay, it's always hard. It's just an identity. That's the idea behind this theory, okay? What could be possibly wrong with this theory? question is whether G 
whether these are actually independent of each other. Could G then affect I or C? That's a big question, and we're going to get a little bit at that towards the end. We're not going to go deep into it, but that's where this whole idea comes from. One goes, if one goes down, you could counteract it with the other one going up. And honestly, so you're seeing a lot of projections about the falls in GDP. A lot of those falls are falls in C and I. They're saying, look, consumption and investment are falling a lot right now because of the pandemic, and G is staying the same. So we're going to see a fall in Y. But if G increases right now, if the government gets its act together, they could go out and they could uh, do things in the economy, then we might not see as big of a recession. So that would then balance out. Um, again, the question is, what can or like? Are they going to do things that actually help? Could it actually hurt? Is it short term, long term? These are all like really, really big questions. Um, no one complained about the audio during that video, so either it worked fine or no one's really paying attention right now. Fantastic. <laughs> Let's look at government activity before the depression. Um, this in 1929, government, the U.S. government expenditures were only three percent of GDP, okay? Very small role for the government in the economy. National defense was 22% of that. Helping veterans was 25% of that. So like a solid 50% of that was just defense related in some way or another. There was another 22% that was interest on debt. So not that many programs. This was just, hey, we'd borrow money in the past. Now we're paying interest on that. And then the remaining 28%, went for everything else that the government did. Hardly anything, right? That's national highways. Those are grants of the states. Uh, those are projects to prevent flooding and improve navigation waterways. The post office. Oh, the slides were partially in the way. I did not think about that. I'm sorry. Well, you've got that link. It's quality stuff. Um, and administration of the government. You have, um, you have all of these different contributions to what else the government was doing. But the government was hardly doing, and at least the U.S. government, was hardly doing anything in, uh, in terms of national economic activity. No poverty reduction in there. Okay, The U.S. government, like the federal government, Washington, D.C., was not participating in poverty reduction or had really small role in it. Most of that was at the local government level. You had states and cities doing their own poverty reduction activities. It was very distributed. It was not centralized uh, in D.C. The takeaway from this is that the government historically was not actively involved in the economy, which is hard for us to imagine today with what a big role the government has. But it was historically not actively involved, and it wasn't really in a position to immediately respond. It's not like, oh, yeah, we have this whole mechanism in place where we know that this is what we need to do to respond. This was, you know, spending money, surprisingly, was not a common activity for the government back then. Um, oh, I, uh, I don't have, do I have, oh, I do, later on, I'll show you some other statistics, I believe. Yes. Okay. So that is the government's involvement in uh, economic activity leading up to the Great Depression. So again, that was 1929 is what I believe. It. Yeah, 1929. So that's right before the Great Depression hits. This is where the government is. 3% of GDP, not doing that much. Um, but they, there's this new emerging theory that, hey, maybe the government could help with economic fluctuations. Let's talk about monetary policy now. This is, again, you know, ha happening at the government level. And then we're going to talk about fiscal policy. Okay, fiscal policy being government spending, monetary policy is what we're doing with the money, uh, the money supply and other policy aspects. Okay, here is the graph of the price level from uh, 1922 through 1940, I think is where this ends, roughly. And you see through the 1920s, we have prices increasing and then we have that sharp decline starting in 1929, and it keeps going down and then recovers. So this period right here is deflation. And we talked about this in the last lecture. We talked about this with the gold standard. 
I put up a video yesterday about uh, whether the Fed's actions were going to lead to inflation, and I talk about deflation there. Actually, this is a really good time to tell you an experience I had just today. I went out to buy something. You know, I went to a local business to buy a, kind of a bigger purchase, um, and I happened to talk to the store owner. I was asking him, you know, how are things going here? What is it like? And man, it was like he was just reading an economics textbook to me. He's like, well, you know, business has gone down a lot. I had to send all my employees home. I didn't fire them. They're still on payroll, but, you know, they're getting zero hours right now because we can't afford to have them work right now. And hopefully when things get better, we can have them come back. They're all part-time employees, um, but still like worried about the fact that he can't actually pay these people. Um, and also he's like, I, I just have all this inventory that I need to clear. And so I've been lowering prices to try and get people in and buy. And then he, you could just see him. He's like, I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do though. Cause I'm worried about whether people coming in and they buy these things and they buy them at the lower price. Is that going to affect my profits? Am I going to be able to pay the bills if I'm selling the stuff at the lower price? And that is exactly the deflationary spiral that we talked about. I talked about in the video that I posted yesterday. We talked about when we talked about the gold standard, right? You have this drop in demand. People buy less stuff, prices go down. Because of those two things, profits go down. You have a few fixed costs you can't change. You can adjust on the margins where you have variable costs, but fixed costs like his rent. I brought up, I was like, yeah, you know, you have rent that you have to pay. He's like, yeah, I have those payments I have to make no matter what, right? He has fixed costs and then he has variable costs like labor. And so he saves on variable costs by sending some of his workers home and then because workers are getting sent home around the whole area, that further reduces demand, which gets us back at the top of the spiral. Because demand is further reduced, prices go down, output goes down, we have lower profits, more unemployment, right? That's what's happening during this time from 1929 all the way through 1933. It's just... just dive in deflation because things just aren't going well. Now we know what happens in 1929 that leads to this huge deflation and that is the crash of the stock market. That's that starts this deflationary spiral then you have bank runs, you have the gold standard, you have all those things leading to deflation. What is it that happens here in 1933 that leads to the recovery? At least the the pickup in the price level. Right? This is the beginning of the recovery. What happens at this point? So this is actually lines up perfectly with the date that FDR is inaugurated. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, what is it that led, why is it that FDR's inauguration led to this big recovery? Um, oh, this is an interesting question. If a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, then how many quarters have to pass to make it a depression? I don't know. I don't know if we have a formal definition of a depression other than it's a really, really bad recession. I don't know if we have a formal definition of that. Um, that's a good question. I think it's just it's a recession and it's really bad. And so we usually don't know if it's a depression until after the fact. So here is Franklin D. Roosevelt. He's elected in 1932, and he's, his election is largely in response to dissatisfaction with Herbert Hoover's handling of the economy. A lot of people thought Hoover was not doing what he was supposed to do, that he was not responding to what was going on in the economy. Uh, and so they elect Franklin D. Roosevelt as this kind of message of change and hope. Um, FDR does not campaign on a clear vision of what he would do to fix the economy. Um, it's not like he's saying, this is my plan coming into this, this is what we're gonna do. He's open to ideas. He has this, yeah, we're, you know, we're going to fix the economy. I'm happy to have people he, you know, help with this. It's not like he's coming out and saying, this is what we need to do and this is what's gonna take us out of the depression. He did believe in surrounding himself with smart people. He, he has this, famously uh, known group called the Brain Trust. They were there to 
um, advise him, to counsel him, you know, whatever your beliefs are on what his ultimate actions were. You know, this idea that you should surround yourself with people who know more than you do, who can help you and who can advise you. I mean, this is a good general principle for you to follow in life. The, one of the first things he does is he declares a bank holiday. So FDR takes office on March 4th, 1933, and then on March 6th at 1 a.m. So, you know, this is not that, you know, this isn't even 48 hours after he's been president. FDR suspended all banking transactions. All banks had to shut down. They couldn't accept deposits. They couldn't give out withdrawals. Banks were just shut down. There's two goals from this. First is to get everyone to calm down. Like leading up to this, some people started doing like bank runs, runs actually increased right ahead of the election. People were thinking, oh, like FDR is going to be elected. Who knows what's going to happen with banks? And so bank runs actually increased. So it's not that bank runs have gone away. They're still very much in force right at this point. So he's trying to get everyone to calm down. Remember, bank runs are like toilet paper runs. Everyone's in this panic to go out and buy toilet paper because they know there's a limited supply of toilet paper and they know that if they don't get their toilet paper today, somebody else is going to get that toilet paper and so there's not going to be any toilet paper left for them when they actually need it. So you have these two issues or you know, people are panicking and so the way that you get everyone to calm down is just say no more sales of toilet paper or in this case no more bank transactions, right? Like we're just going to shut down banks for a little bit. That's the first goal. Get everyone to calm down. Second goal, give the government time to figure out how to stop banks from failing. I just got a a comment that my audio is out of sync. I'm sorry. That drives me crazy. And I have no idea how to fix that on this stream. Let's see. Um, It's not receiving enough video. You know what? One of the problems might be that YouTube has clamped down on um, on video quality because of uh, of traffic. I know they've downgraded quality. I really hope this uh, it stays good. We'll see how if we can get smooth streaming. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. Second goal. Give the government time to figure out how to stop banks from failing. Right? We have these banks that, you know, what, what does the government need to do? This is essentially what's going on today with our you know, self-isolation, social distancing. Everybody just get in place. Everybody, like, let's not stay where you are at home so we have time to figure out how to stop what's going on. Let's, let's just give the government a second to breathe and figure out what's going on. So the bank holiday is kind of like what's going on today. So it ends up being 10 days later, the bank, uh, the bank hol- after the bank holiday began, the banks are reopened. But during the holiday, the government classified banks by, by how likely they were to succeed. There were three classes. There's class A banks that were solvent, and they're open immediately. Remember we talked about solvency back in the Panic of 1907? solvency is this idea that you have enough assets to cover your liabilities. You might not be able to get them right now, but you're a healthy bank. You have what you need. So those were class A banks. There were class B banks, which were endangered. They might be insolvent. Maybe they're, they're, they're not endangered. They're probably illiquid. They don't have enough access to the, uh, the finances they need right now. But with some time, they could reopen. And then you have class C banks, which were insolvent and not able to open. Okay, class A, good. You know, great bank. Class B, probably a fine bank. Class C, bad bank. This is not not good. So insolvent means that you have, so if you're insolvent, you don't have enough assets to cover your liabilities. If you're illiquid, you have the assets, but you just can't uh, get them at the time. So if you're solvent, you also have the assets. You might have them, or you might be illiquid. So you can be solvent and illiquid, or you can be insolvent and illiquid. Whatever the case is, like 
the class A banks, they are solvent. Class B banks, they're kind of in this dangerous territory. Maybe they don't have enough assets to cover their liabilities. Maybe they need enough time. It, like may, with some time, maybe they'll do fine. Class C banks, insolvent, not able to open. Are Class C banks like a trust? Uh, they could have been trusts. Uh, this is applying to trusts at the time. Um, they're worried about trusts. We're going to get into what happens with trusts in just a second. But yeah, so we have these three classes of banks. And so on March 15th, Banks controlling 90% of the country's banking resources are open. Customers are confident that their bank is sound, right? Like uh, class A banks are able to open. Class B banks, they're, we're going to tell you they can reopen a little bit. Class C banks don't open, right? This immediately restores confidence because, hey, if I, if I know, if my bank opens, then I know it's a good bank. I know it has assets. I know that I'm going to be in the clear if this opens up. Okay. If my bank didn't open, that's awful. But guess what? That didn't happen to that many. 90% of the country's banking resources were open on March 15th. Okay. Customers were confident that their bank was sound. On that day, when these banks reopen, deposits were much higher than withdrawals, which is amazing. Let's think about this. You have this, um, you have you've gone ten days without your inability to deposit or withdraw. You might be worried that like, hey, I've been running down my cash. Bank finally opens, um, and then, man, this bank. I'm getting bad signals that this is not working really well. I'm I'm sorry, guys. So deposits were much higher than withdrawals on that day, right? Like on this day when people could finally go in, people were confident enough to go put their money into the bank. So this led to banking, or so let's look at what happened with banking closures at this time. Mid-1929, there were about 25,000 banks open. By 1933, with all the bank runs, with everything that had happened, it shrunk to 18,000. When that bank holiday ended, 12,000 were allowed to reopen. Later, 3,000 more opened. So that's a 15,000 survived after that 18,000. But that means that in four years, 10,000 banks disappeared. 40% of banks operating in 1929, right? Like that's a huge loss of banks over that time. Um, after this, bank runs and emergency closures basically ended after that banking holiday. Uh, the holiday calmed people down. The government took important actions to prevent future panics. And I'm getting flashing lights on how well the stream is coming through. If, um, Okay, what else happens? The U.S. abandons the gold standard. This ends up being a pretty big deal. Great Britain, as I mentioned in the last lecture, had already gone off the gold standard in 1931. And remember, that was when they left the gold standard in 1931, that was causing lots of gold to leave the economy. Um, because people were worried that the U.S. is going to get off of the gold standard. Um, on April 20th, FDR suspended the gold standard. The country, so you couldn't export gold. The government was no longer required to convert currency to gold, right? Like the gold standard is not working. Or like we've just abandoned it. In May, FDR receives authority to reduce the gold content of the dollar. So they start changing how the conversion of gold and dollar uh, American currency. And in June, Congress eliminates gold clauses um, from, uh, let's see, gold clauses in public and private contracts. There are contracts that said, hey, we, uh, you know, we're going to put gold in there. You have to pay us back in gold instead of dollars to try and protect against inflation. Congress gets, or the government gets rid of these, says, we're not going to have these gold clauses. Not important detail, but really interesting. Then comes this gold purchase plan. In October, the government begins purchasing gold at higher prices, which reduces the value of a dollar and induced inflation, right? Like the government is trying to purchase gold and put money out there. And so it used to be, if I, like what it gets to eventually ramps up in 1934 when the U.S. returns to the gold standard Instead of going back to $20.67 per ounce, 
which is what it used to be, which was what it was during the classical gold standard. The new price is now $35 per ounce. That all, you know, this is a huge step towards inflation. Um, do I have my, where's my, oh, let's see. I'm flipping through these slides right now. So the goal of getting off the gold standard was to induce inflation, okay? It was to get prices higher, okay? And the way that I remember this is if you look up here, I can't highlight, but on that second bullet point, let's see, that second bullet point, on April 20th, FDR suspended the gold standard, okay? The way that I remember this is that on 420, FDR suspended the gold standard because he wanted prices to get high, Okay, that's what this is really one of those disappointing moments where I wish this was live because I usually get some groans or I get some nice laughs at this point. Man, I am I am really upset that I can't appreciate your laughter right now. Please give me an F in the chat. Um, where did the money go that people had deposited? Um, I don't know if the government refunded anything there. I think for a lot of those people, their their money was just lost. I don't know. I'd have to go and see specifically. Remember that 90% of the uh, the banking resources were back on operational when the bank holiday ended. Um, so um, I think that those people just lost their money. So what are the benefits of increasing... Oh, good. I'm getting some Fs in the chat. Thank you, guys. Um... <laughs> this is great. Death of the live stream. Okay, so sometimes we look at increasing the money supply as a bad thing, right? That printing more money will increase prices. It's going to bring in inflation, right? Like this is, this is the topic of the video that I posted yesterday. Increasing the money supply has important short-term benefits, especially during a downturn, okay? Although in the long term, prices will increase, in the short run, we say that prices are sticky, that prices do not change. Why don't they change? Well, so sticky means that prices don't change, okay? You might be in some sort of contract, right? Like this is the labor contract that you're in and it says this is the price that people are going to be paid. Um, it could be social norms that we don't immediately drop these prices. Some prices do drop, right? Some prices do rise. But overall, prices kind of stay the same. Let's think about it. Like when these restaurants open back up, like, so I just drove by Angie's today and I saw that Angie's was closed. Like, you know that we're actually in a public health disaster when the local greasy spoon shuts down, right? So that, you know, when Angie's opens back up, it's not like they're going to just all of a sudden raise prices and say, well, you know, now we think there's more money in the economy and we need to raise prices. No, they're going to keep their prices at the same thing as they were. You know, keep customers happy. It's going to cost money to change those menus. Um, whatever the case is, those prices are going to pr stay pretty much the same. Prices are pretty sticky. My favorite example of sticky prices, so if you, oh, um, that was actually a pretty convenient noise right there. Let me get this. So these are prices from, um, what's the timeline on this PowerPoint? 1890 about all the way up through uh, 1950, I think is where it goes. Um, oh, to f oh, it's got, good thing I put this little label right here. 1886 to 1959. So you see inflation, you see deflation as we get into the Great Depression, and then you see inflation as prices start rising again. Well, during this entire time, Coke, which is that red line at the bottom, stays at five cents can of Coke, bottle of Coke, it would have been a bottle, stayed at five cents for something like 70 years, I think is what, I can't remember what the end uh, number is. Stay, so why does Coke stay at that price for so, so long? There are a couple of reasons. There's uh, a, like a marketing reason, like, oh, a, a bottle of Coke only costs five cents, and they keep that marketing that's like key to their corporate identity. Um there's also the technological issue where a lot of these Cokes are being sold in vending machines and vending machines can accept a nickel or a dime, 
right? Like they, they weren't accepting pennies. And so you had to go from five cents to 10 cents. That's a huge, you had to double prices when you raise it. And Coke didn't really want to double prices. On this link right here, I put this Coke podcast when you look at the slides. If you don't have the slides, go look at Planet Money Coke. We have this great uh, podcast on this because they explained that one thing they experimented with were vending machines that would sell blanks. Okay, so you would sell like six bottles of Coke and then the seventh bottle would be empty, right? So you would sell you know, six bottles at five, well, you'd sell seven bottles at five cents each, but you'd only really sell six bottles worth of Coke. And so you got that fifth, that seventh bottle to get five cents. So that kind of averaged out over the other ones is fantastic. I mean, this is just, this is just economics amazingness, right? Like let's sell people empty bottles of Coke. You're kind of putting in this lottery, like, okay, like I hope I have a full bottle of Coke when I put my nickel in. And if I don't, well, I better be prepared to pay for another. This was just an experiment. I don't think this ever went widespread, but it's some some marketing genius. If you want to hear that story, go check out the Planet Money Coke podcast. One way I try to explain what inflation is like, it's like going to Chuck E. Cheese, which like has I I heard that they got rid of the animatronics in Chuck E. Cheese, which is just such a disaster. But Let's imagine that you win a game, and normally when you win a game, you get 100 tickets. But now, Chuck E. Cheese, they want people to be excited to be at Chuck E. Cheese. So when, they, when you win, they're going to get 200 tickets, right? Like, let's increase the number of tickets that you get when you win. And that makes you excited, right? Like, you start going, and at first, you play more. You're getting a huge payout, and you go to the prize place, and you can buy lots of stuff, right? But then eventually... They're going to raise the prices, right? They can't keep that going forever, but they're going to bring in people. They're going to get more people working because, you know, it's pretty cheap to print tickets. It's pretty cheap to provide these prizes. So people get excited. They start spending these tickets and then it's going to cost. Eventually they have to raise how much it costs, right? So now like to get like a tiny plastic army army man costs like 500 tickets or something, right? Where it used to only cost 10 tickets. Uh, but that's because tickets used to be hard to get. But Chuck E. Cheese has its own form of inflation where tickets become cheaper and cheaper and you have to play more to buy, right? But at first, it gets you really excited. You start playing more, you get more activity. And this is the part where, again, like I need that interpersonal interaction to make sure I understand what's going on with you guys and see if this ex- example is making any sense at all. Um, but on the topic of Chuck E. Cheese, uh, oh, you can't really see my little buddy back here. Where is he? Right there? That's Gengar, right? So I remember, so for my students watching at home, this is the watch party contest. Gengar is the secret word. Go ahead and send me an email, a picture of yourself watching the live stream, hopefully with some friends, um, and show me the word Gengar. And you'll be entered in the watch party contest today. Okay. All right. This is taking a little, I spent probably a little bit too long on one of these topics. I don't know yet, right? (laughs) But here we go. Gold standard and the recovery. Why does the gold standard lead to recovery? Well, people at the time, they're just not happy that FDR is abandoning the gold standard. They say that this is completely immoral. This is a terrible thing to be doing. But today, the consensus is that abandoning the gold standard is, if not what finally stopped the depression, it definitely helps with the recovery. It's what, at the very least, we have the understanding that countries that left the gold standard earlier started recovery earlier as well. Because remember, the depression began because the Fed was too tight with the money supply. They weren't getting money out there to people. And then abandoning the gold standard is a way to increase the supply of money, right? Like we're just going to be able to print this money. We're going to get it out there. We get it to the people. And the U.S. is not the only example of this. The general pattern in the econ- uh, is that economic recovery began sooner when we abandoned the gold standard. So here's an example of we abandoned the gold standard here in 1933. We begin the recovery. Here is a bunch of countries let me expand this out again, where you have 
the the UK leaves in 1931. I, you can't see my mouse going over this, but if you look at the UK line, they have the shallowest depression and quickest recovery. If you look at the US in 1933, that's right when we start recovering. Italy recovers. Uh, <clears throat> they abandoned the gold standard in 1934. They're recovering really well. France takes the longest to rec- to abandon the gold standard, and they stay in the Great Depression the longest as well. So there seems to be you know, at least a correlation between being on the gold standard and recovering from the Great Depression. Um, There's the Glass-Steagall Act. This is officially called the Banking Act of 1933. This is another big thing that happens where they're with the banks. Where the, the features here... The big, the big feature here we're going to talk about is the pause insurance. There's this commercial versus investment banks thing that we might have to skip for the sake of time. But here are some local banks, at least banks that you'll see if you're going around town. I, I grab these off of ads or their websites or something, and what you'll see anytime you see a bank advertised today is this little note, member of the FDIC. And yes, credit unions also have their own credit union insurance thing. We're focusing on the FDIC here. This is deposit insurance. Glass-Steagall is what establishes federal deposit insurance in the United States. And this guarantees deposits up to a certain amount, right? So the original limit was $2,500. And today it's $250,000. So as long as you have uh, less than 250 today, if you have less than $250,000 in your bank account, if your bank fails, you'll get all of it back. Now, for most people, myself included, that's fine. I do not have $250,000 in the bank right now. If you're doing summer sales, I understand you might be worried that not all of your money is covered, but you know the rest of us, we're covered, and I feel good about that. Um, well, this is an important aspect of the recovery. Is this dinging? Oh my goodness, this is dinging a whole bunch. I'm going to have to mute this. I've got everybody. Thank you guys for sending in your submissions to the watch party. Uh, I realized that there might be some dinging though <laughs> for the stream. Um, now the problem, with, the reason why we have bank runs is because people don't think they're going to get their money back. And so the FDIC stops bank runs. There's no incentive to rush banks to withdraw your deposits. It's like having insurance on toilet paper. If you knew that you were guaranteed toilet paper when you needed it, you wouldn't run to the store to get that toilet paper, right? So FDIC stops you from having to rush on the the banks okay you're, you if your bank fails you can recover your money up to the limit it's adequate for most depositors it stops bank runs okay we basically have not had bank runs since the great depression there have been like one or two um that have been no, nothing serious and then in 2008 you could say there was a run on the money market but we haven't had bank runs like, like we used to have bank runs all the time and it basically stopped with the fdic There's also this idea of commercial versus investment banks. Essentially, a commercial bank, as we've talked about, is the type of bank that you go to. Like when you think of a bank, that's a bank. Wells Fargo, Zions, um, J.P. Morgan. Well, I don't know. Is J.P. Morgan today a commercial bank? Anyway, if it you put your money in there, you get loans when you need it. That's a commercial bank. Investment banks are the banks that deal in securities like stocks and bonds. Right? Um, They help companies go public. Well. The crash of 1929 came from banks lending money to individuals to buy securities, these stocks, right? Like that's the margin purchases. We're giving you money to buy these things. Commercial banks were acting like investment banks. Glass-Steagall comes in, said banks have to choose which one they're, they're going to be in. Once you choose, if you decide to be commercial, you have to stay commercial. If you decide to be investment, you have to stay investment. But there becomes a clearer delineation between commercial and investment banks. Um, It's uncontroversial at the time, but even till this day, we're discussing Glass-Steagall and the separation and how it affected the 2008 recession. Okay, how did the fiscal policy affect recovery? So that was broadly monetary policy and financial policy is the way to think about like what's going on in the financial sector. Now we're going to talk about government spending and how that affected recovery. This is 
the New Deal, right? We're ha having references to the New Deal today. This is, you know, you'll hear about it, the Green New Deal. It's drawing inspiration from this time when um, and when FDR had this huge package of policies that went out. Um, FDR buys into this idea that the government can rescue the economy. That yes, we can have this happen. And monetary policy is consistent with the Keynesian model, first off. Like having the government intervene in monetary policy is consistent with it. But FDR goes further. And he wants to have this massive fiscal expansion, this massive government spending expansion. This is the list of New Deal programs that are started. Let me, I mean, it, I mean, this is what you would see if you were in the class anyways, right? Just this big screen with tons and tons of names up there. So many programs start with the New Deal. Some of them we've already mentioned, like uh, Glass-Steagall, um, there's another banking one in here. I can't remember. It's just so many things start with the New Deal. We're, we, there's no way for us to talk about all the programs. It, it, if anyone, I hesitate when I say this, but I want you to know that if anyone says that like any blanket statement about the New Deal, they're probably wrong because the New Deal involves so many different programs. We can't say just one thing about the New Deal generally. So let me go into a few of the projects in the New Deal and talk about what we know about them. So there were public works and relief. These public works were things like these large uh, long-term po projects like dams, roads, sewage plants, right? Like public works, getting out there and working on infrastructure projects essentially is what we would call them today. And then there's also relief programs. Try to help the unemployed, um, we're going to build schools, sidewalks, you know, we're going to have the unemployed, we're going to use the unemployed people to go out and build schools, sidewalks, those kind of things. Some of these are make work projects. We call make work projects these things where we're just, we're going to pay you to do things even though we don't really need them done, but we just want to have you working and we want money spent. So the, yeah, some of that is going on. Remember, remember when I hand, held this up and I said, a really important assumption is that when we increase G, it doesn't affect C or I, right? We would be really concerned if we affect, if we increase G and it further decreases C and I, then it's not getting the full bang for its buck that we think it is. Well, what we know from the research is that there's no effect on private employment from this. Like it, there doesn't seem to be much of an effect. Um, there might be a negative effect. So it might have crowded out that other work. Like it might have pushed that down. So there might have been a negative effect for this, but there's kind of a consensus that these, these projects, public works and relief, tended to be a, a good way to work towards the recovery. Here's one, the Agricultural Adjustment Act grants, the AAA. So the AAA was this idea that it was supposed to... Um, it's a land conservation, right? So they want to take land out of production, farmland, right? The reason why you want to do this is if the farm is produ if you have less farmland in production, then you're going to have supply go down. If supply goes down, prices are going to go up. And so they're trying to induce inflation through uh, land use. And the goal was to get farm prices relative to other prices back to the 1914 ratio. So they're trying to Get infl they're trying to induce inflation by reducing supply. What are the effects? Of I mean, it's just crazy. Like this is literally like people like destroying farmland to try and be in uh, accordance with this, which just you know obviously does not sound like a good idea. Well, there the effects of this one. There's a slight negative effect on income, so it does help out farm owners, the people who own the farms. They're getting more income because their prices are going up, but it ends up hurting farm workers. So you're helping one group at the expense of the other. Um, you have tenants, you have croppers, you have farm workers all losing their jobs, losing a lot from this. Um, and then you also have a lot of people substituting towards machinery. They're using this as an opportunity to use more machinery in their agriculture. And so you end up leaving a lot of workers behind. So this is, again, so this is a project that probably did not help with recovery. And then you have the National Recovery Administration, which is, again, 
great because some people believe that the Great Depression was caused by excessive competition. Oh, this is, I mean, today you might say like, oh, this is because we have too much capitalism in the society. society. And so the NRA is what this is called, National Recovery Administration. They're supposed to come in and create this stable, balanced economy. We're going to have things working. We're going to create fair codes of competition. We're going to have we're going to have the industry leaders choose how to compete. Like the heads, this is like getting Amazon and Apple and Google to come together and say, you guys are in charge of how the, how we're going to have these standards. We're going to have you guys be in charge of how the economy is run. Now this didn't actually go into effect, but it's a, it's essentially a cartel. This is a cartel sanctioned by the government that says, Hey, you guys we're going to put you in charge. You guys have full authority to run this economy. It's crazy that this was the suggestion in retrospect. The Supreme Court eventually declares it unconstitutional. It didn't last that long. It does go in effect. It doesn't last that long. Supreme Court says, hey, this, this is not right. This is unconstitutional. And it probably hurt the recovery potentially a lot. Just in the little time that existed, potentially hurt the recovery by a lot. So when I said earlier, like, we can't make sweeping statements on the, the New Deal, like, the general research is that there is no strong link between the New Deal, just broadly conceived, if we think about the New Deal as all these programs, there's not a strong link between those programs and recovery from the Depression, okay? Um, one of the leading scholars on the Great Depression says that nearly all of the studies of New Deal relief and public works spending fine at best small positive effects, and sometimes negative effects on private employment. That gets back to this equation right here, right? You have, uh, it's always hard to angle this, Y, C, I, and G. Increasing G might not have affected these other variables, but they could have as well, okay? So the New Deal, at best, did not really help the country get out of the Great Depression. At worst, could have prolonged it or made it worse, okay? However, it's indisputable that the New Deal changed the government's role in the economy. Remember, I gave you those figures from 1929, and government activity was 3% of GDP. In 2008, so this is 12 years old at this point, but the government was about 19% of GDP. And a lot of that expansion came from the role of the New Deal and this idea, this mind set change that said the government should be more involved. I'm going to see if I can quickly find today. Let's see. Uh, is this saying? No. Oh, okay. It's been a little bit lower than historically. I should have looked up what it is today um, to give you a, a more updated idea. But this is this is helpful when we think about the recession, which we're going to talk about at the end of the semester, that the government in 1930 was in a very different position than the government in 2008. Um, another thing that happens from the New Deal is that many of these programs exist today that started in the Great Depression. So Social Security, farm subsidies, housing subsidies, a lot of these programs started with the Great Depression and they continue on today. Here, I mean, it, it, the New Deal has big effects just not on the recovery. One of my favorite quotes, blessed are the young, for they shall inherit the national debt. Herbert Hoover, right before, probably right before he left office. For the last few minutes of this lecture, let me give you some insight into Utah history when it comes to the Great Depression. And not just Utah history, I'm talking about Logan. Mariner Eccles, okay? This is a picture of Mariner Eccles. He was born in Logan in 1890. Okay, pretty cool. Um, when we meet, you know, we're not meeting right now, but if we were meeting in person, we would be in the Eccles Business Building that is named after Mariner Eccles' brother. Okay, Mariner Eccles completed three years of high school, never attended college. He ran banks here in Utah and managed to keep them open through the beginning of the Depression. Right, like banks are failing like crazy. The banks run by Mariner Eccles stay in business. Well, in February 1933, the Senate invites 46 prominent businessmen from all over the U.S. to come to D.C. for their views on what happened during the Great Depression. 
Eccles is one of these because, hey, they're like, look, your bank stayed alive. What did you do? Eccles comes in and he basically outlines the Keynesian model, which is amazing when you consider that Eccles developed this without reading anything by academic economists, right? He only went to three years of high school. He didn't have formal training, but he had kind of thought through these things on their own. He said that our depression was not brought about as a result of extravagance. The difficulty is that we were not sufficiently extravagant as a nation. We did not consume what we were able to produce, right? He says there's been this fall in aggregate demand. We need to get aggregate demand up. And then he outlines this plan for how the government could raise the economy out of depression. Some people think that the New Deal comes from Mariner Eccles, from Logan native Mariner Eccles was the one that created the New Deal. Some people say that we might be giving him too much credit, but the idea is he has this kind of role in this. Um, here's another quote from him. The theory of hard work and thrift as a mean of pulling us out of is unsound economically. True hard work means more production. But thrift and economy only mean less consumption. And this is, this is just a profound insight, right? Hard work and thrift. Well, if you work hard, you're going to produce more. And if you have thrift, you're going to save more. So like that might work on the individual level. But if the whole economy does that, if the whole economy works hard but then doesn't spend, we're going to have this gap between what we produce and what we consume. And now we're going to have this problem where we're going to have some sort of recession, right? So it's just this... This is really interesting insight. Milton Friedman, who I've mentioned before, says, I believe Eccles played a far greater role in the development of what later, uh, what came later to be called Keynesian policies than did Keynes or any of his disciples, which is not surprising at all, right? Keynes' disciples are all academics. Like, this is the fact that acad academics might have some sort of impact on the world is you know, minimal, right? Like we, we know they don't have that much of an impact as sad as that is, but to have somebody who's in the business world and adopting these policies makes more sense that he would have that kind of impact. So in 1934, FDR appoints Eccles as the chair of the federal reserve board of governors and Eccles leads the fed into its new era mission, right? The fed has kind of been reconceived at this point and they have Eccles is being given the reins to lead it into this new era. This is the Federal Reserve Board building in Washington, D.C. It is named after Mariner Eccles. This is the Mariner Eccles building. It is named after somebody born here in Logan. In fact, I did a video where I went and, like, his house is still here. You can go look at his house. I did a video where I went inside the Federal Reserve and I went by his house to give you this kind of connection between the two. If you, uh, I'll put a link to it when this is over, but the, it's called what's inside the federal reserve board. Um, you can go visit his house. It's on center street. It's pretty cool. And I just think that's amazing that some guy, some, some kid with little education from Logan grows up to become one of the most powerful economic policymakers in the United States. I think you should see that as inspiration. Of course, there's also the role of world, world war two in the, uh, in recovery, and this is a strong case for fiscal policy having significant effects. Um, the U.S. had to mobilize resources, which ended up being a boon to the entire economy. That's what that little bump is right there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about World War II next week when we get to women in the labor force. Um, but Thursday, in Thursday's lecture, we're going to talk about immigration in American economic history. Um, so we're going to go Thursday, immigration, then next week, We'll do women in the labor force, and we'll do uh, the civil rights movement. So we're going to do a couple of labor ideas with immigration, women in labor force, and blacks in the labor force. All three of those lectures have reading, so make sure you stay up on those. Um, and then we've got some more exciting stuff coming out. I, I, I love some of these lectures. These are some of my favorite lectures at the end of the semester. I wish we could be in person together. I'm sorry. I miss you guys. I hope that you're having a good time. And I look forward to seeing you guys on Thursday, same time in this live lecture. Hopefully everything comes through smoothly. We'll see ya.